On the morning of March 3rd, 1993, in Silver Spring, Maryland, Vivian Rice stopped by her sister's house on her way to work. But this morning, something was wrong. Both garage doors were open, and her sister's minivan was missing. Inside the house, Vivian would discover a brutal, triple homicide, executed by one of the most ruthless and cunning killers to ever challenge, the FBI. Three people were found murdered in their home. It appeared like a burglary gone awry. But a crime this horrific deserved a closer look. The suspect who had the most to gain from the deaths also had the perfect alibi. Photographic proof that he was 3,000 miles away when the crime was committed. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. It's our job to find the holes in even the most bulletproof alibi. In this case, we had our work cut out for us. A Montgomery County, Maryland police officer responded to Vivian Rice's frantic 911 call. He found a female victim dead just inside the front door. He also found a second woman dead. And a young boy, apparently murdered in his bed. We've got uh, three victims here. We need uh, detectives and uh, evidence technicians over here. Through the day and into the night, investigators would scour the scene for evidence, thoroughly searching both inside and outside the house. They soon identified all the victims. Mildred Horn was a 43-year-old divorced mother employed as an American Airlines flight attendant. She had been shot three times in the head. Her eight-year-old quadriplegic son, Trevor, who required round-the-clock nursing care, appeared to have been suffocated. Police found him disconnected from his respirator. And Trevor's overnight nurse, 38-year-old Janice Saunders, had been shot twice, in the skull and in the eye. Evidence technicians began work immediately. They were thorough, but there was little evidence to collect. They dug a single distorted bullet fragment from the wood beside Trevor's window. Investigators took swabs of blood, carefully collecting samples for DNA testing. But the blood would match only the victim's DNA. With so little to lead investigators to a suspect, technicians scrounged harder for clues, collecting anything and everything that seemed promising. Outside the house, investigators found a metal file. Police were thorough, but the killer had been meticulous. Montgomery County, Maryland homicide detective Craig Wittenberger, named lead investigator, struggled to make sense of a case with three helpless victims, no obvious motive, and few clues. There were some things that struck us as odd, I think, from the very beginning of the on-scene investigation inside the house. The foyer area, a closet, the contents had been dumped, everything had been pulled out of the closet, dumped onto the floor. We found a purse, which we would later learn ultimately belonged to Millie. You had a lot of stereo entertainment equipment, TVs, a lot of jewelry, furs um, that was untouched and left. 
which again strikes you as odd. If this is a if this is a burglary or robbery going bad, you're going to take something. In fact, Mildred's minivan was missing from the garage, as her sister had noticed. But it was found quickly, not far from the house. Some of Mildred's credit cards were also missing. But found the next day on a nearby roadside by a jogger. Investigators now positively eliminated burglary as a motive. Instead, they wondered if the missing items were a deliberate attempt by the killer to throw them off his trail. The scene had the earmarks of a planned, professional execution. As for a suspect, at the crime scene, Vivian told them Mildred's ex-husband, Lawrence Horn, was probably responsible. She begged them to investigate. He quickly became the prime suspect. All the family members were giving us this information that kept pointing to Lawrence Horn that would be based on um, the very stormy, rocky relationship that Millie and Lawrence Horn had had for many, many years. Uh, Danny, could you get this drum set up in number five for me, please? All right. Investigators learned that in the 1960s and 70s, Horn had been a top producer and recording engineer for Motown Records, credited with many hits, including Shotgun by Junior Walker and the All-Stars. He'd married Mildred, an airline attendant, in 1973. Then, he'd moved with Motown from Detroit to Los Angeles. But when the company's fortunes waned, so did his. He and Mildred divorced in 1987, but their problems continued. As Bob Dean, Maryland assistant state's attorney, soon discovered. We did some research on Lawrence Horn in the courthouse that day. Uh, particularly um, what the status of his child support uh, payments were and whatever civil uh, aspects of his ongoing uh, civil battle with his wife were. And he had just been held in contempt several months before for failure to pay $18,000 $18, in child support. But in reviewing more court records, investigators learned that on March 3rd, the day of the murders, Horn's financial outlook had brightened considerably. With his wife and son dead, he now stood to inherit $1.7 million. The money came from a malpractice settlement awarded to Trevor when a routine operation left him with brain damage. Should Trevor die, the settlement also listed his beneficiaries. The beneficiaries of Trevor were obviously his mother and his father, and that was Millie and Lawrence. If Millie were dead, Lawrence got everything. At Detective Wittenberger's request, the Los Angeles Police Department contacted Lawrence Horn within hours of the murders. Lawrence, I think you better come out here. Yes, Bob. They tracked him to his mother's house. Mr. Horn? I'm the police Nolan, told Horn Los about the murders yeah, and Los were surprised by his response. Am I a suspect? No, sir. Mr. Horn's behavior was very odd. It was odd enough that the LAPD officers took note of it from the very, very outset. Not only did he not want to cooperate and want, a, want an attorney, um, Basically, his only questions or inquiries about were whether he was a suspect in this thing. Police took him to the station for further questioning. They asked where he was at the time of the crime. He told them he was with his live-in girlfriend, Shira Bogan, and described their activities. Later, they would question her, and she'd corroborate his story. I was at home. If Horn or someone he employed had crossed state lines to commit the crime, they would have violated the interstate travel in aid of racketeering statute. 
Crime, a federal offense under FBI jurisdiction. Now, the FBI was brought in. A heinous crime had shocked the quiet community of Silver Spring, Maryland. A triple murder that brutally ended the lives of a quadriplegic boy, his mother, and his overnight nurse. With the prime suspect 3,000 miles away in Los Angeles, the prospect of an interstate investigation loomed. Local detectives called on the FBI. Okay, all right, goodbye. Special Agent Ed Roach was Great, named case agent. We'll the case uh, immediately became a coast-to-coast -coast, uh, investigation because the principal suspect uh, was living at that time in, in Los Angeles. So uh, we involved uh, the Los Angeles Division of the FBI. Perhaps uh, that we could assist uh, later in the investigation, either uh, through uh, profiling at Quantico or with the assistance of uh, the FBI laboratory. Desperate for more clues, investigators sent a canine team back to where Mildred Horn's credit cards had been found by a jogger. The team soon recovered a rusty piece of metal, badly corroded, but clearly a gun part. Wittenberger sent it to the FBI lab for testing. FBI examiners determined the part was a trigger mechanism from an AR-7 rifle. A gun that's easy to disassemble into small pieces for transport or disposal, which seemed exactly what the killer had done. He had also taken another step to distance himself from the weapon. He'd very carefully drilled out the serial number. Often, a trained examiner can piece these numbers back together, but this killer had erased them for good. Another firearms expert would determine how long the gun part had lain by the side of the road. Analysis showed the amount of corrosion was consistent with the time elapsed since the killings had occurred. So this was likely the murder weapon. While the FBI lab processed the gun part, investigators in Maryland interviewed Tiffany Horn, Lawrence and Mildred's 18-year-old daughter. Right straight ahead. She was a student at Howard University in Washington, DC. They gave her a routine polygraph test, which she easily yeah. passed. Did you commit those murders? No. Later that day, Tiffany would talk with Detective Wittenberger, revealing three key clues. The first was something that had happened in the summer of 1992. Her father had called, asking her to videotape the outside of her mother's house for him, along with Trevor's room. The idea was so bizarre, she'd only taped Trevor and his nurse with Trevor in his bed attached to his respirator. Tiffany gave the tape to her father. Now Wittenberger and the FBI wondered if Horn wanted someone to know the layout of the house. Then, on March 1st, two days before the murders, Horn had called her again. He wanted to know where his younger daughter, Tamiel, would be for the next few days. Tiffany said Tamiel would be with Aunt Vivian the night of March 2nd because her mother was flying out on an early flight the morning of March 3rd. It made investigators suspect that Horn had known when the murders would occur. <laughs> Tiffany shared one other revealing incident that day. At about 2.30, the morning of the murders, she had inadvertently Tiffany. called her mother. What time Tiffany had hit the wrong speed dial key on her phone. She'd meant to call her boyfriend. She apologized and hung up. 
The timing of the call helped investigators estimate the timing of the murders, along with another observation. Trevor's round-the-clock nurses made entries every hour in a logbook near his bed. Based on that, the 2.30 uh, phone call, the 2 o'clock entry in the nurse's log, and there not being a 3 o'clock entry, uh, and the autopsy findings, I think we pretty much based the time of death as being around two, between 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. On March 11th, about a week after the murders, Wittenberger and his partner flew to L.A. Police officer, search warrant! With the assistance of the Los Angeles Police Department, they carried a probable Clear. cause affidavit to search Horn's apartment. They collected hundreds of audio and videotapes. Police also gathered computers, personal papers, address books, bank statements, and telephone logs. Back at the station, investigators began the time-consuming task of reviewing all they'd recovered. They'd printed thousands of pages from the hard drives of Horn's computers. They found he'd made handwritten notes on documents regarding Trevor's settlement money. The notes confirmed what they already suspected. Horn was well aware he could gain a fortune from his son's death, and he was well versed in the legalities of the settlement. Investigators also found a map that was telling. It was hand-drawn, showing Mildred Horn's neighborhood. The streets were outlined and labeled. An X and her initials marked her house. Had Horn been directing a stranger to find her? Perhaps a contract killer? In the hundreds of hours of videotape that were recovered and screened, one home movie stood out. Horn had videotaped himself standing in front of his television set, which was tuned to the cable TV program guide station. The station was clearly broadcasting the time and date. 11.45 p.m., March 2nd, 1993, California time. 2.45 a.m., March 3rd, Maryland time. Exactly the time and date of the murders. Investigators quickly dubbed it the alibi tape, since it seemed to have been created for that purpose. Now, Wittenberger and the FBI seemed to have some substantial leads, but they were still far from apprehending the mastermind of this brutal crime. There he is again, same city, walking back. When investigators searched the L.A. apartment of their prime suspect in a triple murder, they discovered a suspicious videotape. Among themselves, they called it the alibi tape. But they would soon find a recording that was even more incriminating. A 22-second excerpt from Horn's dozens of audio tapes. It was from a conversation between Horn and an unknown male. The words were cryptic, but their meaning was clear. Can you play it? I gave a talk. No. Okay. All right, so I mean, I'm sitting there. Can you, uh... I take a picture, I can take a picture of him, you know, right, you know, right. Face there, but I couldn't, the noise, you understand what I'm saying? I wasn't able to do that. I didn't, I didn't want to go uh, front wise. After listening to that, we felt Mr. Horn probably was in Los Angeles at the time. Uh, we also felt after listening to that conversation that this was probably the individual that committed these homicides making that phone call. With the help of the FBI, investigators subpoenaed telephone records from AT&T for all the calls placed to Lawrence Horn's residence from a week before the murders to a week after. Most were useless, but four long-distance calls stood out. Two had been made just days before the murders from a Detroit payphone. 
The other two were made in the early hours of March 3rd from payphones near Mildred Horn's house. One from outside a Denny's restaurant and the other from a day's inn. The call from the Denny's was made to the home of Lawrence Horn. At 5.12 a.m. Maryland right. time, just a few hours after the murders. What is going on? What kind of it? Was it the cryptic 22-second conversation? Yeah. And who had made the call? Investigators spent hours scanning dozens of registration forms from local motels. The uh, check of the hotels and the motels in the area, uh, a few miles circumference of the murder scene, turned up an individual checking in approximately midnight the day these murders were committed to the day's end using a Michigan driver's license in the name of James Edward Perry. James Edward Perry seemed a promising suspect. With Lawrence Horn's roots in Detroit's music industry and the Detroit call in his telephone records, perhaps there was a connection. Background checks revealed he'd served about 10 years time for shooting a Michigan state trooper after an attempted bank robbery in the early 1970s. Now, he was a minister. He claimed he would be able to pick lottery numbers for people. Uh, people could call him for his advice. Uh, he had business cards and flyers that he would hand out, uh, that he was, like I say, a, uh, a minister. I believe he called himself on some of these things, Apostle James. As investigators learned more about Perry, Wittenberger had picked up another trail. In Lawrence Horn's telephone records, he'd noticed some calls had been made on a calling card. What do you want? He subpoenaed the records. The name on the card, was Camilla McKenney. Uh, FBI agents appeared at Camilla's address. Instead, they found Marsha yes, Webb. It turned out she was Lawrence Horn's cousin. Oh, no. She said Horn had asked her to get the card, claiming he needed Lawrence it for business. She'd made up the name McKenney. She thought her past payment problems might keep her from getting a card. The calling card records revealed a complex web of phone calls. They began almost a year before the murders and continued for several months after. We examined the records for that calling card account and saw that there were numerous calls throughout 1992 and 1993 from pay phones in Los Angeles payphones that we plotted out on a street grid, primarily within walking distance of Lawrence Horn's house. It went you? directly to James Perry's house in Detroit. Yeah, I could do it. And likewise, there were numerous calls from 1992 to 1993 of payphones throughout Detroit, primarily on the east side of Detroit, which is where James Perry lived to Lawrence Horn's house and in Hollywood. Was. And we figured Perry was looking for the rest of his payment. And uh, we, we surmised that, uh, that Horn was waiting for uh, his windfall from his son's estate. But if it seemed investigators had finally hit the jackpot, the prize remained just out of their grasp. Connecting suspects to calls required painstaking detective work, logging the time and phone number where each call was made and received, then attempting to place the suspects accordingly. Horn and Perry had covered their tracks with many layers of deception. Investigators were beginning to bog down, and their frustration was starting to show. It starts out at an extremely, extremely fast pace. Um, everything's hot and heavy, very uh, uh, high-profile murder, uh, murder case. Everything, like I say, is rocking and rolling very quickly. Uh, then, all of a sudden, the skids are put on. It, the investigation starts to slow down. 
because now we're, we're, we've almost shifted gears and now going into a documentation that turns into almost a paper trail case. But Wittenberger and the FBI stayed on the trail like bloodhounds. And in late September of 1993, they closed in on James Perry. They began a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week surveillance. We had the Michigan State Police and the FBI. Both, both agencies agreed to put him under surveillance in a cooperative effort. It was during a week in September that we saw that James Perry hung out with a particular individual. We didn't know who he was until we checked the tag of his car. It was a guy named Thomas Turner. A background check showed the 52-year-old Turner was a trucker by trade. More significantly, he was another of Lawrence Horn's cousins. He was also fast friends with Perry. The two had met in prison 13 years before, when Perry was serving time for the state trooper shooting incident and Turner for robbing a bank. Identifying Turner would prove an important break in the case. But for now, investigators were hoping for something more immediate. Wittenberger and an agent did what investigators call tickling the wires. They paid Perry a visit, thinking Perry would then contact Horn and start talking. The investigators only talked briefly with Perry, but he admitted he was in Maryland on March 3rd though he claimed it was for business and that he knew nothing about the murders. In September of 93, after weeks of wrangling for court authorization to tap Lawrence Horn's home phone, federal agents finally got the go ahead. Special Agent Roach was key in obtaining the approval. We were hoping to get the smoking gun, the conversation between James Edward Perry and, uh, and Lawrence Horn. We were hoping for a conversation that would say uh, something like, uh, I want the rest of my money, you know, I did the deed, uh, the down payment's not enough, uh, you promised me such and such, I only got this, and uh, now I want the rest of my money, or maybe uh, you're gonna be next. Something like that would have been terrific but Horn and Perry were too sly to let anything slip. And by mid-November, with the investigation at full tilt, they stopped talking to each other altogether. Despite months of slow but steady progress, Horn and Perry were still one step ahead of the law. The FBI's coast-to-coast -coast investigation of a triple murder committed in Maryland left agents scrambling to link L.A.'s Lawrence Horn and Detroit's James Perry to their case. Investigators knew the two men were talking, but they didn't know how. Were they using Perry's former jail buddy, Thomas Turner, as a go-between? The FBI secured authorization to tap Turner's phone. Yep. That was the key. Yeah, Both Horn and Perry oh, talked yeah. to Turner often, yeah, okay. that's, and that's Turner no relayed messages between uh, them. That? But they were careful not to use language that might incriminate them. And once again, uh, agents found themselves back in the same old grind, monitoring and logging hundreds of calls, two, then trying to make links between the callers. All right, I'll talk to you later. One surveillance would be taking place, actively taking place, a physical surveillance in Los Angeles on, uh, on Lawrence Horn, while at the same time, 24 hours a day, the Detroit Division was conducting physical and electronic surveillance on Thomas Turner and physical surveillance on James Edward Perry. As before, they made a few connections between calls and callers, but mostly the process seemed just a test okay. of their endurance and dedication. Horn and Perry were giving them a run for their money. Then, around Thanksgiving, after three grueling months, investigators got a bite. Perry was preparing to move. 
agents secured a federal warrant to search his residence before he left. It was a dangerous mission. Perry had shot a Michigan police officer, and he was known to own high-powered weapons. An FBI SWAT team made the entry. Wittenberger and his partner followed. They roused Perry and his girlfriend from bed, catching them unaware and unarmed. Then they began to search the house. Police collected videotapes, bank statements, and other documents. Much of what they found seemed strangely out of place in the home of a so-called minister. There were voodoo relics, Soldier of Fortune magazines, and books on topics like criminal investigations, managing gunshot wounds, and interpreting bloodstain evidence. Investigators hoped to prove that Perry had bought the books as well. They called the publishers, getting only one hit from Paladin Press. A canceled check proved to be the turning point in the case. Perry had ordered two books from Paladin Press about a year before the murders, two chilling titles, Hitman, a manual for independent contractors, and how to build disposable silencers. When you read through those books, it was very disturbing to see the number of similarities and parallels from the Hitman book to what transpired inside Millie's home on March 3rd. Finally, the pieces began to form a single picture. Mildred's missing minivan was explained. Perry had used it to get back to his rental car, which he'd parked some distance from the crime scene, as the book recommended. The credit cards, found by a jogger on a road near the house, also fit in neatly. It said, to, if you want to make it look like a, a, a burglary, do a little bit of messing around the house, take some items and then throw them along the side of the road. It said, throw the pieces of the rifle along the side of the road. Another thing that the book recommended was to take a little narrow file and run it through the barrel of the rifle. And uh, a little narrow file was found in the backyard with uh, deposits of chemicals consistent with gunpowder res gunshot residue. The book also suggested using an AR-7 rifle exactly the gun whose trigger mechanism was found earlier. Likewise, examiners determined the single spent bullet found in Trevor's room was 22 caliber, popular with assassins. 22s distort when they enter a human body, so it's hard to match them to a gun. They're also small, quiet, and inexpensive. In January of 1994, there was another big break in the case. After months of pressure from Wittenberger, a grand jury subpoena finally brought in Thomas Turner. He agreed to talk in exchange for immunity. In a deposition for a Maryland grand jury, Turner said his cousin, Lawrence Horn, had come for a visit in May of 1992, five months before the murders. Though Turner hadn't seen him in 20 years, Horn immediately complained of trouble with his ex-wife, Mildred. Turner gave him the name of James Perry. That's all Turner would say, though Wittenberger believed he knew much more. Fortunately, he'd said enough. At, at that point, because of what we had learned from Thomas Turner and what we had learned from um, in the Hitman book and the wiretaps, we felt we were in a position to establish a conspiracy, to establish that James Perry had, in fact, carried out the killings. That summer, Wittenberger struck. On July 19, 1994, he arrested Horn at his Los Angeles apartment without incident. 
Wittenberger would question him for 45 minutes at the police station, but Horn refused to talk about the crime. On the same day, FBI agents in Detroit were waiting for a judge to sign the warrants for the arrest of Perry. In the meantime, they conducted an overt surveillance. The tactic is designed to pressure a suspect while making sure he doesn't flee. It wasn't supposed to be a covert surveillance, so we really didn't care if he saw them or not. Uh, we just didn't want it to be a confrontational surveillance until the warrants were signed. Once the warrants were finalized, agents could arrest Perry. Until then, they would follow him in the open, knowing he knew they were there. They would keep him in sight at all times. Perry grew increasingly annoyed. The FBI didn't let up. It seemed Perry wondered what the FBI was trying to do, though he seemed more irritated than concerned. He drove off, still in clear view of agents. They didn't know where he was headed, but stayed with him anyway. He stopped to pick up a friend. Agents were not familiar with. Stranger to me. The two drove off in Perry's car with the tail close behind. Well, let's give him something to play with. Stay right on. Credulous, agents guessed where Perry was going. After only about an hour, the constant tale had made Perry so angry, he decided to file a complaint. Amazingly, he took his gripe straight to the Detroit FBI field office. Perry's timing was incredible. He and his friend arrived at the office just as FBI agents awaited final word on his arrest warrant. I want to see an FBI agent now. This is a bad idea, Perry. Now. I want to see an FBI agent right now. Perry demanded to see an agent. I'm not going to calm down. And he was quickly accommodated. A clerk called Special Agent Roach. Bring him on in. Come on, you sir. Hold them sir, we step aside, please. While agents checked him for weapons, Perry confronted Roach, wanting to know if agents were going to arrest him or if they were just planning to harass him. First of all, I appreciate We told him in minutes you were going to be expect a phone call from Montgomery County, Maryland, telling us the warrants have been signed and you've been indicted for three counts of first degree murder. And the telephone came in a few minutes later, and we advised him that he was, in fact, under arrest. But now, even with both men in custody, one question still remained. If Perry was the hired gun, how had Horn paid him for the crime? After months of relentless pursuit by local investigators and the FBI, the elusive Horn and Perry were finally in custody. But there remained a nagging question. How had Horn paid Perry for the crime? The answer came two months later, only as a result of still more dogged detective work. As we were reviewing the results of the search on James Perry's house, we noticed this photograph that, in essence, showed various cassette tapes that James Perry had. Uh, that was the purpose of the photograph, but underneath one of the items here, we saw a Western Union card. 
we got a bundle of records from Western Union showing us that there were indeed a number of transactions from Los Angeles to James Perry's live-in girlfriend, Pauline McGee. The person sending it was George Bernard Shaw. Well, we now had another area to investigate for a few months. After much digging, Dean discovered a man named George Bernard Shaw had died in July of 1992 in an auto accident in Los Angeles. When Dean sleuthed out the LA Times for the day of Shaw's death, he discovered the man's connection, though it wasn't in his obituary. We have on the front page, Mary Wells dies. And for those in our generation, she was a big Motown star. Go to the obituary page, big story about Mary Wells dying in Los Angeles. In the lower right-hand corner was a list of other people who had passed away. One is a guy named George Bernard Shaw, with no information about him, just the cemetery. Lawrence Horn had used the name of this anonymous dead man as the front for his payments, which were made with the money Horn was able to save. Almost two years after the crime, investigators had finally pieced together the whole story. It had been a cold and calculated murder for hire that took more than a year to plan. James Perry had followed the instructions in the Hitman book almost to a T. Perry had bought an AR-7 rifle and drilled out the serial number as the book suggested. And he'd built a disposable silencer using the book's directions. He'd carefully cut the parts and assembled it. He also packed a bag of supplies a brown mechanic suit so he could walk through Mildred's neighborhood looking like a repairman, and latex gloves so he'd leave no fingerprints. In the months before the crime, he and Horn had talked often yeah. discussing each detail. At Perry's request, Horn had sent him a map of Mildred's neighborhood and a video of Trevor's room. Horn had chosen a date when Tamiel would be out of the house his only show of mercy in this heinous crime. On the appointed day, Perry had driven a car rented by Turner from Detroit. He checked into a motel near Mildred's house in Maryland. Perry had paid cash as the book recommended, hoping the motel wouldn't require an ID. I have to see some ID. I'm paying cash. I need to see. But it did. Without his Xerox driver's license, police might never have cracked the case. We couldn't believe that he did something that dumb, that put him in Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, on the date and the time of the murders. Then, he'd driven his rental car to a shopping center near Mildred's house and walked from there, following Horn's hand-drawn map. In the house, unsuspecting, nurse Janice Saunders made the 2 a.m. entry on a medical log attached to Trevor's bed. Perry approached the French doors at the back of the house, as planned.
likely took Saunders completely by surprise. But when the boy stopped breathing, his medical alarm spoke for him. Upstairs, his mother awoke. Mildred Horn went downstairs to investigate. There, she too met the killer. Harry shot Mildred three times in the face. roughed up the house a little to make it look like a robbery gone bad. As the book instructed, he took Mildred's credit cards. But it seems the persistent beeping of the medical alarm unnerved even this calculating killer. He stuck to the manual instructions. On his way out, he quickly bored out the gun barrel using the metal file to foil ballistics tests as the book instructed. For a quick escape, he took Mildred's minivan back to where his rental car was parked. On the way, he'd scattered Mildred's credit cards and the gun parts, though only the trigger mechanism was found. All right, so I mean, I'm sitting there. Can you uh... take a picture? I can take a picture of him, you know, right, you know, right there, but I couldn't. The noise, you understand what I'm saying? I wasn't able to do that. I didn't, I didn't want to go uh, front way. It was a case that had to be put together by uh, really an exhaustive search of every clue possible, every clue imaginable. Um, and, and we literally spent a year and a half, two years, doing nothing but working on this case. In September of 1995, two and a half years after the murders, James Perry was brought to trial in Maryland. Bob Dean served as special prosecutor because of his intimate knowledge of the case. Perry received life for conspiracy and three death sentences for the murders. Those death sentences were later commuted to life. Perry has no chance for parole. He is never admitted to committing the crime. Lawrence Horn's trial began that April in a packed Maryland courtroom. He faced the same charges as Perry, so much of the same evidence was used. Bob Dean again served as special prosecutor. After a five-week trial, the jury found Horn guilty on all counts. He showed no emotion, and like Perry, he never confessed to the crime. On May 13th, Horn received three life sentences without parole. He appealed once and was denied. I think both Mr. Horn and Mr. Perry did a very good job in planning this, and they came very close to getting away with this. There would be one more bittersweet victory for the families of the victims. Following the murders, they filed a federal lawsuit against the publishers of Hitman, a technical manual for independent contractors. In late May of 1999, they won the suit, including a multi-million dollar settlement and a promise from the publisher to stop selling the book.